so hello. Uh, first, I would like uh, to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, Jan, in fact, uh, asked me to, uh, well, he said it is an informal workshop and I should present some ongoing works, even if it's not finished, and that's more or less what I'm going to talk about, things that are not finished. Uh, so um, there will be some new results, but quite technical, so I will not insist on them. But uh, I will try to show you the picture of where uh, things are going. Um, so first of all, uh, topological recursion on resurgence. Well, resurgence is the topic of this conference. I hope that by now you all know more or less what it's, what it's about. Uh, topological recursion, while well, some of you are really experts in the room, but I'm expecting that some of you don't know at all what it is about. So let me start but by basically what is this about, topological recursion? Well, first in topological recursion, there is the word recursion. And recursion means that you have some initial data and the recursion produces a sequence. Uh, in fact, for me, it will be a double. So in, instead of being indexed by one index, there will be a double index that I will call G uh, that runs from 0 to infinity and N that runs from 0 to infinity and it will be a, a recursion on both integers. Uh, so in topological recursion, what is the initial data? The initial data is called a spectral curve. A spectral curve, you can think of it as a complex curve or, uh, or, pla or, or plain curve together with some additional structure that I will explain very shortly. And the topological recursion, so let's call it S, a spectral curve. Uh, the topological recursion will produce a sequence that I will call omega gn of S. Uh, so with g on n uh, running from 0 to infinity. Um, okay, so it will produce this double sequence uh, that we call the invariance or the topological re re recursion invariance of S. And uh, it is so. So it is uh, well. The, the reason why it's called topological it's basically because omega g n uh, will be a certain universal function, let me call it t r, of all the omega g prime n prime, uh, such that uh, g prime 2 g prime plus n prime minus 2 strictly less than 2 g minus 2 plus n. So in fact, it is a recursion on 2 g minus 2 plus n, and this is the one of the reasons why it's called topological. But uh, in fact, in this talk, I will just talk about what the topological recursion is computing, what it is useful for, why it, is, it can have some relationship to resurgence questions, but I will not explain uh, how it is computed. That's not the purpose of this talk. Um, so how to compute. So I'm not going to write the recursion. So first, what is a spectral curve? What is a spectral curve? Well, the easiest thing to think uh, about uh, when you think of a spectral curve is the locus of zero of some polynomial equation. So take the locus of zero uh, of a polynomial equation. So it's a subset of C cross C, let's say. Uh, and uh, so in C cross C, in the x, y, so you have a curve. In fact, x and y are in, are in C, so it's in fact a two-dimensional, and in fact C cross C is a four-dimensional space, and you should think of it as a kind of surface. So in fact, it's a, it's a, it's a surface. Well, okay, it's just a picture. Uh, so, but in fact, this restriction by the locus of zero of a polynomial equation is a little bit too restrictive for my purposes. And I will define something slightly more general. So the uh, spectral curve, 
uh, S will be the data of four things, a Riemann surface sigma, and let me write for the moment just things, and I will explain what they are. So sigma is a Riemann surface, It does not need to be uh, compact, neither connected. It can have boundaries, it can, have, uh, it can be disconnected, it can be just a union of disks. X is a map from sigma to another Riemann surface that I will call sigma zero. And in, in fact, I will more or less always take it to be CP1, the Riemann sphere, uh, which is called the base. And so uh, and X is analytic, uh, holomorphic. So it's an holomorphic projection uh, from sigma to uh, sigma zero, uh, which makes sigma a ramified cover of the, of let's say, the Riemann sphere. So sigma is a ramified cover of the Riemann sphere with this x, and basically there are ramification points. Uh, why? Well, in this picture uh, here in the set zero locus of equations. So uh, basically, the projection is just when you have a point x, y here, you just project it to the plane. Uh, y would be you project it to the other direction. But in fact, the other direction, y is thought of here as an element of C, of a complex plane. But it's better, in fact, to look not at y, but at the one form, y dx. y dx is a one form. So let me write it y dx. It's a one form on sigma, and that will assume neuromorphic. Uh, in fact, we can do even more general than neuromorphic. Uh, and in fact, it's due to the fact that C is also isomorphic to the cotangent space of C. T star C is isomorphic to C just by multiplying by dx. Uh, so in fact, y dx uh, belongs to T star C. Uh, and we have a fourth thing. So le let me. Sigma is a curve in a cotangent bundle to sigma zero. Yeah. Well, this defines. So initially, sigma was just defined by, as a curve, yeah. and we require that it has uh, so it, it has bundle. a map to the cotangent bundle. Yeah, but will we need a curve in C star cross C star as well? Sometimes, yes. In fact, it's not a bundle. in fact, as I said, sigma is not necessarily uh, sigma is not necessarily compact. So you can just remove pieces from sigma where you can have essential singularities, and in particular, you can remove the places where you would go to zero or infinity in C star. So you just put boundaries instead. Okay. Uh, so it's the cotangent bundle, but uh, the curve is not compact. Uh, so. Um, so yes, so the idea is that you have uh, your Riemann surface sigma, uh, and it has so there, there are two. So indeed, there, there is a map from that to the total cotangent bundle, and so to each point p of sigma, you associate a point on that curve, which has both an x projection. So this is x of p, and this is uh, y dx at p. The fourth data of a spectral curve, this b, is in some sense it can be thought of as a choice of cycles here, as a marking of cycles. Well, in fact, again, it's a little bit too restrictive to think of a marking of cycles. So uh, what we introduce is something slightly more general. Uh, for compact curves, it is nearly equivalent to a marking of cycles, but for non-compact curves, I need something more general. And B will be a one tensor one form on sigma cross sigma. It is symmetric, and it has a double pole on diagonal. So this means that basically, if you take two points, P and Q, B of PQ, in any local coordinate, so let me identify uh, P 
P as the local, let me say that P is the local coordinates. So you want something like dp tensor dq, it's a one tensor one form. There is a double pole at p equals q, and plus something analytic. So you want basically that this has no pole at p equals q, and uh, the wall has no other pole than uh, the diagonal. And I will insist that I will put a coefficient one in front here. So in fact, you can say that b belongs to h0 of sigma cross sigma uh, to the canonical bundle to the square, the symmetric tensor products, uh, twisted by a pole, a double pole on the diagonal. OK. OK. A square. Yes. OK. Which means that, uh, yes, the first k go go corresponds to the first projection, the first second k corresponds to the second projection. OK. So here again, we, we could write this. OK. But I didn't want to insist too much on that. So, uh, so this is my initial data. It's a spectral curve. So just let me give an example. Uh, an example when the curve sigma is a torus. There is a natural candidate for the B, B of PQ. So basically P on Q, uh, P on Q, uh, P be, let's say belongs to C quotiented by Z plus tau Z. So it's the complex plane quotiented by variation Z equals Z plus one and Z equals Z plus two plus tau and then be, uh, would be the Weierstrass function, p minus q. So this is something that has a double pole, as p equals q, uh, times dp dq. And you can add an arbitrary constant here. And this is basically all what you can do on a torus, which is a compact Riemann surface. And the choice of a constant is nearly equivalent to a choice of uh, marking of cycles. So, uh, so this is the notion of spectral curve. So now uh, the topological recursion, the topological recursion, as I said, associated to a spectral curve S, it associates the, se the sequence omega g n of S, a sequence with g on n. As I, again, I'm not going to write the definition, but just let me say what are the first few members of that sequence. So first, omega 0, 1 uh, is just the one form y dx. Omega 0, 2 is the one tensor one form b. So basically, uh, y dx and b serve as the initial terms in, uh, in this sequence. And then, uh, there is a recursive procedure to find all the other omega gn's. I'm not going to write it, but I'm just going to mention that omega gn of s is a uh, is, um, tensor product of forms on sigma to a power n. So basically, it's uh, one. So it's a uh, one form. Uh, sorry, it's a form depending on n points on the curve. It's a one form in the first point, a one tensor one point in the second point, sorry, one form in the second point, tensor one form in the third point, and so on. And it is symmetric. So sigma n, k sigma tensor n, and symmetric. And it has poles at the ramification points of, well, some order. OK, so it just means that uh, basically locally, omega gn of s evaluated at point p1, pn, uh, will be something like dp1 tensor dpn times here the coefficient is a symmetric function of all the pi's uh, and with poles only at the ramification points.
You don't set up n, n equals zero? Sorry? No, uh, here this is here the, the ramification points, the poles are, are only on the, on the list here. Okay, here here uh, okay and um, let me continue. So that's indeed for n positive. And for n equals zero, a zero form is just a scalar, it's just a complex number. A zero form, and in fact so omega g zero of s uh, is just a scalar. Uh, and in fact, it is denoted uh, fg of s in the literature. So it's just a complex number. For a given spectral curve, it's just a complex number. And uh, so we have a sequence of complex numbers. Now, uh, okay, this is, I'm just, I just explained what topological recursion computes. It computes sequences of forms and numbers. And uh, why is this useful? Uh, it's useful because uh, these sequences appear in many applications in enumerative geometry, in random matrices, in combinatorics. Uh, and I will give some examples very shortly. So how do I get the... So I will give some examples shortly, and some will be related to knots. Uh, so, but before that, I want to give another definition. So um, this is the link with the notion of resurgence. Out of this collection of numbers, we are going to make series, formal series. So let me introduce another definition. So, no, sorry, just before going to, to the next thing. So, let me uh, define what is the rescaling, rescaled, rescaling of spectral curve. So if you have a spectral curve S as above, you define lambda S by definition is you keep the same sigma, the same X, you multiply Y dx by lambda and you keep the same B. So this is just the rescale, uh, spectral curve rescaled by lambda means you just rescale the one form. And there is a theorem, uh, which is that omega gn of lambda s is, so omega gn is homogeneous of degree 2 minus 2g minus n omega gn of s. Uh, this is, if you know the definition of a recursion, this is kind of trivial. Uh, just because one form enters only in the denominator. So, now let me define some other objects. The, uh, so, let me call it the would-be tau function. Of a spectral curve. Okay, and let me give this definition. Z, I'm not going to call it tau because it's not yet the tau function. But there will be a tau function, but it's not exactly that one. Uh, and it's a formal series, so it depends on a parameter a, on another small parameter that I will call h bar. Uh, and very shortly, I will change the notation. So, but by definition, this is the exponential of sum over g equals zero to infinity of h bar to the 2g minus 2 fg of s. Which you can see due to the homogeneity property is the same thing as exponential sum over g of fg of h bar to minus 1 s. So, in fact, let me call it z of h bar to minus 1 s. So this is a formal series. This is a formal series. And so I would like to call that a tau function. But first, if this formal series is divergent, it's not even a function. So, uh, so in fact, that's where we meet resurgence questions. How can we give a meaning to that series if it is typically factorially div divergent? 
And then, in fact, uh, it's not the full definition, and we know that uh, if it is a divergent series, there is a missing part, which is, uh, well, plus, uh, I will call it trans series, with typically exponentially small terms in h bar. So typically, uh, things like exponential minus 1 over h bar a terms. Which I'm not going to write, but in fact, I have a more complete definition, which is the one we uh, found with Marcos, uh, where here there are additional terms uh, that are expressed in terms of the invariance, of the topological re recursion invariance, but I don't want to write them, but just know that there is other terms. Uh, and I will, I would like also to define a would-be uh, wave function or, or in fact also sometimes I call it Baker Akizer function the would-be wave function let me call it psi and so it depends on my h bar minus 1 s and it depends on a point p on the curve so you choose p, a point on the curve, p belongs to sigma here, and it is defined as exponential sum over a double series, uh, sum over g on n, h bar to the 2g minus 2 plus n over n factorial, and uh, so there will be omega g n. Okay. And since omega g n is an n form on sigma n, so it's one form in the first variable, or one form in the second variable, and so on, you can integrate the first variable on a certain path, you can integrate the second variable on a certain path, and so on, and I integrate the first variable from infinity to p, the second variable from infinity to p, and so on, all the variables on the same path from infinity to p, uh, where infinity is, uh, let's say, a special point on the curve, typically the one whose x image is at infinity. But uh, it doesn't matter too much for the moment what... Uh, well, in fact, in my papers, this is not exactly the good definition. This one is a little bit an approximation of, of the actual definition. And again, plus uh, trans-series terms. All right. So, uh, now why is this interesting? Uh, and so, the first remark, uh, sorry, we have defined some objects, so I borrowed the language of integrable systems, tau function, baker Akizer function, uh, because indeed what is believed, but I don't think we can say this is totally proved, but it's proved case by case in many cases, uh, indeed, this has to do with integrable systems. And basically, the topological recursion would be somehow the, the way to the asymptotic expansion of, int of classical integrable systems. Uh, so, uh, but so, as I said, the first difficulty here is that typically, and this is the recent result I was talking about, uh, the, it's a theorem, uh, Fg grows factorially. And basically, Fg is bounded by O of, uh, let me call it beta prime G factorial times R to the minus G, where R positive on beta prime, the Gevre index is, at, is bounded by 5. In fact, in many applications, we know that it should be beta prime equals 2 uh, in practice. So they grow like 2G factorial in practice. But the only bound what I was able to prove for the moment is 5. But I know I did some overestimation, but it's enough already to say that uh, a Borel transform does exist and is convergent in a certain disk. Now it doesn't say if it is endlessly continuable to infinity. And for that, we have to really understand the geometry. And the fact that we have a recursion for the coefficient 
means that we have some information about the geometry. Um, so first, let me now go to some examples. And also the omega g and grow factorially. Um, so the Baker aqueous function also has the same issue of, uh, of some ability. Uh, excuse me, but you have defined omega 0, 1, and, uh, but not fg. So it's hard to yeah. They are defined in, in my previous papers, and I don't want to say what the definition is. I just believe it, it's a black box. Uh, you have a spectral curve, you put it on your computer, you press the button, you get fg. <laughs> but you, maybe you must say something, because otherwise the whole thing is just a black box. I'm going to give some examples uh, which will be more concrete. So let me give some, and in fact that's what I go, was going to do now, example. Uh, so example one is we shall take the simplest of all spectral curves, so y squared minus x equals zero. So plotted in the xy plane, it's just this square root curve. There is obviously only one ramification point here. And let me translate it into my language. So it corresponds to the case where sigma equals, well, let's say c. Uh, X is the map from C to CP1, which to X, uh, which maps the point Z to Z square. And Y of Z is Z. So you can check that indeed Y square minus X equals zero. Uh, and the B of Z1, Z2 is DZ1, DZ2 over z1 minus z2 to the square. OK, so this is that very simple curve. And now I can tell you what the fg's are for this curve. In fact, the fg's are not so interesting, so let me write the omega gn's. What is omega gn for that curve? So that was proved, uh, that omega gn for that curve. So it's a function of n points of the curve, so n points in the complex plane. Uh, and so it's a product i equals 1 to n of dzi. Uh, so it's, an, it's a one form in each variable. And there, is, there are poles. We know that the poles are only at the ramification point, and the ramification point corresponds to z equals 0. So basically, we expect that there are poles of this form zi to the 2 di plus 2. In fact, you can check that this is always an even form, uh, odd form, sorry, uh, 2di plus 2. Let me normalize by the coefficient 2di plus 1 double factorial. And so we have a sum over d1 dn. And here you have a coefficient, which depends on those numbers, d1, d, d2, dn, the degrees. And it depends also on g, on n, on this coefficient is tau d1, tau dn g, and it's, it is some very important number in algebraic geometry, in enumerative geometry, which are called the witten koncevich intersection numbers. Well, let me call it numbers. They are typically irrational numbers. They belong to Q. And these are just the coefficients. And in fact, they are non-vanishing only if d1 plus, plus dn equals 3g minus 3 plus n. Otherwise, they are vanishing. So basically, what you get is a polynomial in the 1 over zi squares. The, the, the sum here is finite. Uh, so this is an example of what you would get. Uh, in fact, in these examples, the fgs are very trivial. Basically, fg equals 0 except f0, uh, I think f0 is two-thirds. So the would-be tau function uh, would be uh, exponential two-thirds of h bar to the minus two. So it's not a very interesting quantity. But the baker akizer function is more interesting. Uh, let me get the other board here. Okay. Okay. 
So if you compute carefully the Becker Akizer function, so psi of z equals exponential sum of g on n h bar to the 2g minus 2 plus n over n factorial, and you integrate from infinity to z, infinity to z of omega g n. So you just integrate those forms. Uh, you get some, uh, some formal power series of h bar. And in fact, it's possible to recognize the coefficient of that formal power series of h bar. They are exactly the coefficient of the asymptotic expansion of the Airy function with a power minus two thirds z square. And in fact, remember that z square was, was, was what I called x, x equals z square. So basically, it's the Airy function. Uh, well, just this formal series with those coefficients are just the coefficients of the Airy function. So in particular, it satisfied h bar square, sorry, h bar d over dx to the square uh, minus x psi equals zero. Formally, this is, so formally, if you look at this curve here, formally, it's like, so this differential operator is more or less the same thing as above by replacing y by d, so basically you replace y by h bar d over dx. So sometimes this is called the classical curve, and this is called the quantization of that curve. So this is the quantum curve. Okay, and indeed there is an integrable system associated to that, and it's basically the KDV hierarchy. Uh, so is there some bigger piece of chalk? Yeah. So uh, what time is it? Yeah. Uh, so in fact, let me give another example. So. Well, the resurgence properties of the Airy function or the Borel transform of the Airy function is kind of trivial. This is just an exponential. Uh, so I'm not going to, to spend time on explaining what is the resurgence uh, properties of the Airy function. It's very, very trivial. Uh, so it's not worth. Uh, OK, so let me go to the. Last board. So this example was was more. So the example with those uh, this Airy curve uh, was more to show you that indeed those definitions of the, 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 the objects defined by topological recursion are relevant for algebraic geometry, for enumerative geometry, for integral system. They are really interesting objects. Even for you see, even with the simplest spectral curve, you already get very interesting numbers. So now let me go to another example, which is the example of knots. So here I draw the figure of eight knot. Uh, it vaguely looks like an eight, uh, and that's why it's called the, the figure of eight knot. It is the knot used to uh, rope uh, when you do rock climbing. Uh, so it's a, it's a practical knot. And uh, let me... Uh, okay, I don't have it here. I wanted to introduce uh, the notion of, uh, of uh, Jones polynomial. Uh, okay, uh, I... Don't have the expression of a Jones polynomial of a figure of eight knot. Probably Stavros would know it by heart. But okay, there, associated to a knot, there is a notion of Jones polynomial. So let me write it J of Q. It's a polynomial of Q. Uh, on in fact, of Q and Q minus one. It's a Laurent polynomial. Uh, 
Well, the exact expression of a polynomial of the j of that node is something like u to the two. Okay, <laughs> I don't remember. Well, okay, and there is plus, I think, u to minus two or something. I mean, goes, the degree goes between two and minus two or something like that. But there is a notion of colored. There is another notion, which is the notion of colored Jones polynomial on Jn of q is also a polynomial. Uh, it's a polynomial of q on q minus 1 uh, with degree, uh, whose degree? Yes, they, are, they, they have integer coefficients. Sorry. Uh, yes, so they belong to they belong to z of q on q minus 1 and whose degree grows with n. And in fact, here the Jones polynomial is j the case n equals 2. And n is related to a representation, uh, to a Young diagram with n minus 1 boxes. Okay, and it's because it's related to the representation theory of uh, SU2 uh, or SL2C. Uh, okay, I don't want to, uh, to explain what is the Jones polynomials, but it's a very important object in uh, the theory of knots, uh, in no-dimensional topology. And, uh, but a big question, a big open question, is the asymptotic expansion. Expansion in a regime where you want to send n to infinity, q to 1, uh, and such that n log q remains finite. So let me call it u, and which is O of 1. And q, you write it exponential h bar. And basically, this is a limit. So you want, you have, you're looking at a limit where h bar goes to 0, and uh, where n is uh, u h bar. Sorry? u over h bar. Yes. So what is the asymptotic of the Jones polynomials in this regime? And in 1995, uh, Kashaev made a conjecture about uh, the leading order, the leading asymptotic order, so Jn of q, behaves like exponential h bar to the minus uh, 1 uh, and some quantity, some, a certain function, let me call it s minus 1 of u, uh, a certain function of u, and this function of u is such that ds minus 1 of u over du, let me call it y of u, sorry, let me call it y of u, is solution of a certain algebraic equation, uh, solution of some equation, of an algebraic equation. Uh, so there is a certain polynomial that's called the A polynomial. Uh, yeah, I should have called it x, well, okay. Uh, u and, well, let me call it x, so let me call it that y of x is the solution of some algebraic equation, so leave, leave some space here, uh, equals zero, where a is a certain polynomial, but in fact it's not a polynomial equation rating x on y, but e to the x and e to the y. So it, indeed this is c star cos c star. No. Uh, so, and for the figure of 8 not, the A of xy is just y plus y minus 1 minus x2 minus x minus 2 plus x plus x minus 1 plus 2. This one I know by heart. So, this can be used by, so this is, uh, so this will define a spectral curve. So, this defines a curve, a compact Riemann surface. Uh, this defines a projection to the base, 
which is x. This defines a one form, which is y dx. And there is a natural choice of uh, marking of cycles, which defines a b. So this gives our spectral curve. So the a polynomial Uh, gives a spectral curve. And we see that basically this uh, as Kashaev asymptotic says that this is h bar to my, uh, minus 1 integral from, to u or, uh, uh, of omega 0 1 of that spectral curve. Um, okay, I didn't say what is the, the other point, let's call it infinity, I'm cheating you a little bit in this formula. But so, then uh, the next step was how to uh, guess what is the rest of the asymptotic expansion, and so I have nothing to erase here, nearly. And the guess made by, so this, so then digraph Fuji and Malabé says that Jn of Q has this asymptotic expansion, while well, here just let's say it's U, uh, and with that spectral curve. So the omega Gn being computed as the, by the topological recursion from that spectral curve, this would give, uh, this expression would give the asymptotic expansion of the Jones polynomial. So this is the conjecture made by Dagraf, uh, Fuji, and Manabe in 2010. Uh, well, they made the conjecture not only for the figure of eight knots, but basically for all knots, all hyperbolic knots. Uh, so uh, in fact, when Dagraf, Fuji, and Manabe computed that, so they they computed the first few omega Gn's from the topological recursion. Can I ask a question? Uh, so your definition of the spectral curve includes the data of this symmetric form B. Yeah. So what, in this okay. example, where do you... Where? Okay, this curve here, you can check that this is a torus. And there is a natural choice of an A cycle on the torus. Well, here, here, I mean, associated to this projection, there is a... Well, basically, there is a, a kind of natural choice of A and B cycle associated to that representation. It's not only a curve, it's a plane curve. So you, you really have an X coordinate, a Y coordinate. So this makes a kind of, kind of natural choice. And then this gives a B. So you take the B, which is normalized on that cycle. So basically, the B is the Weierstrass function plus a constant. And the constant should be chosen such that this is normalized on the A cycle. Uh, so basically, this is Weierstrass function plus the G2 Eisenstein series. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so, so you from topological recursion, you can compute the first few omega Gn's. You can integrate them. That gives some very non-trivial functions of U, and these are exactly the functions that appear in the asymptotic, ex uh, asymptotic expansion of the knot. But they have a problem. The functions are the good ones, but the coefficients in front of them are not exactly good. So Dagraf, Fuji, and Manabe invented a kind of what they call the renormalization procedure to adjust the coefficient at each step. Uh, but in fact, uh, in fact, it's because they used that expression and they forgot the trans series terms. Uh, so then this is uh, times. Uh, so sum over n of exponential, uh, let's say, n times something, and with uh, exponential 2 pi i tau n square, and 1 plus, so h bar minus 1 n times something, 1 plus, and in fact here it was the b cycle, in fact b minus tau a, uh, no, sorry, B cycles. Uh, 1 plus O of H bar. So this is, there is a full series of corrections. So somehow they took only the term uh, n equals 0 in their asymptotic expansion. So without all the trans series corrections. And it was wrong. It was nearly good, but not, not exactly. And in fact, for knots, there is, so if you compute 
this bicycle integral and also for nodes in fact people were interested only in the case where h bar is 2 pi i over an integer so basically that was the relevant uh, thing that people want to study for nodes and it turns out that this bicycle integral is precisely uh, 4 pi square times an integer so in fact this exponential here is exactly multiplier, uh, well, the, the phase here is exactly a multiplier of 2 pi i. So, in fact, for knots, uh, these transitory corrections are in fact of order 1. And that's why they change the coefficients in the expansion. And in fact, if you take that into account, you get exactly uh, the good asymptotic expansion of the Jones polynomial without having to do any renormalization. So, in fact, this transitory part is absolutely needed. And uh, we, with Borrow, uh, on myself in 2012, we checked that the conjecture uh, is okay for okay up to o, uh, o of h bar 4, which is a very non trivial test. So we, have, we are totally confident that this conjecture is correct, uh, but proving it is really a very, very big challenge. In fact, I think at the moment no one really has, I would say, the beginning of an idea of how to prove it. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but so. Uh, so this is a say different, two different equation. Yeah. Well, one way would be to prove that this would satisfy a q-different equation, but this is hard to, to prove. I mean, okay, this is one possible way, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, order by order in powers of h bar, you can check that indeed it satisfies the q-difference equation. So this is another application of, uh, of topological recursion and, and, uh, and an example where you see that the trans-series part is absolutely essential and it would be very good to re totally understand it. Uh, I want to go to another... Since f q-difference equation is linear, however, you yeah. only know it after constant. And yes. the constant is the volume conjecture. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so indeed, that would not be enough. Okay. Uh, so, let me go to another example. I wanted to talk. So, in fact, yesterday, uh, Ricardo talked about the matrix model integral. I'm not going to talk about that. And let me talk about the DOZZ formula in CFT, uh, in conformal field theory. Uh, so, in fact, we, it, uh, this is, has to do with uh, SL. To see uh, um, space of connection. <laughs> so Dorn, Otto, Zamolochikov, Zamolochikov, and it goes back to the maybe 70s or 80s, or I'm not sure uh, how old this is, this formula. But uh, it computes uh, something uh, which is related to the space of uh, connection of, uh, of uh, SL2C principal bundle. Uh, or bundle on the sphere, so CP1 minus three points. So we have your sphere, three points. Z1, Z2, Z3. It's always possible to choose them to be 0, 1, infinity, for example. Uh, and you are concerned with a connection. So you want to look at a connection on this SL2C bundle. So a connection is something like D minus phi of x dx, where phi of x is a, a matrix in the Lie algebra SL2C, so basically it means it's a 2 by 2 matrix whose trace is 0. And, let's, and it will be a Fuchsian connection, uh, meaning that it has poles, simple poles at those three points. So it will be sum over i equals 1 to 3 of phi i over x minus z i, and where phi i belongs to SL2C. So meaning that trace of phi i equals zero. So it's a two by two matrix whose trace is zero. And I also require that there is no pole at infinity, meaning that sum of phi i must be zero. So this is a connection. Uh, 
In fact, it's interesting to look at the eigenvalues of phi i. So the eigenvalues of phi i are just uh, alpha i on minus alpha i. Okay. Uh, so they are just to, so since the trace is zero, there are two eigenvalues and they are just opposite to each other. You can think of it, in fact, think of the diagonal matrix uh, alpha i minus alpha i, which belongs to the carton algebra. Okay, and there are some numbers that play an important role. Alpha i square is one half of trace of phi i square, it's called the Casimir's. Uh, or and in fact, in conformal theory, alpha i are called the uh, charges. Or the impulsions, or it depends. Uh, so, in fact, if you want to fix the eigenvalues of the three phi i's, up to a gauge transformation, basically, that determines totally the phi i's. So, in fact, you have almost, once you have fixed the eigenvalues, basically, you have no freedom in choosing the phi i's up to gauge transformations. Uh, so, now there is a quantity in conformal field theory that people uh, are interested in, and it's called, well, it would be the tau function. And, uh, in fact, the tau function is something which in conformal field theory is denoted al v alpha 1 of z1, v alpha 2 of z2, v alpha 3 of z3. It's called the product of three vertex operators located at z1, z2, z3 with charges alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. It's a certain quantity. And basically, uh, you can be, uh, so first it was, taught it was computed exactly as a function of alpha i on z i by Dorn, Otto, Zamolchikov, Zamolchikov, and I would give you the, the exact expression in a minute. Uh, but what is the relationship to uh, so you consider these arbitrary because zero to z you is taken usually in a particular limit. Sorry? Do you consider these arbitrary? Yes. Distinct. Yes. Distinct and the charges also uh, distinct and not uh, related by a multiply of, of uh, by an integer shift. Um, okay. Uh, okay, and so uh, in fact so in fact, very soon I'm going to, I, I want to do an asymptotic expansion with a small parameter. So where can we put a small parameter? A way to put a small parameter is to multiply things by h bar here. And it's called an h bar connection. And you see it's more or less equivalent to putting the one over h bar in front of the phi. And so basically introducing the h bar is exactly uh, equivalent to changing the alpha i to h bar minus 1 alpha i. So it's called the heavy limit. The charges become large. So it's the, ch it's the limit of large charges. So if you put large charges, complex here. Well, for the moment, the charges are just eigenvalues of a complex matrix. They can be complex. Uh, I'm in SL2C, not in SL2R. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, you have this quantity, and it was computed by Dorn Otto. So I hope I will get the formula correct. So first, there is a trivial zi dependence. So there is 1 over z1 minus z2 to the power alpha 1 square plus alpha 2 square minus alpha 3 square uh, times, well, the Yes, h bar minus 2. Well, okay. You just rescale all the h bars. Uh, okay, let me not put h bar here. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, the, the final formula will just be, re uh, I mean, the asymptotic will just be in the limit where you rescale every alphas by h bar. So, uh, times, well, there is uh, two equivalent terms with. Uh, 2, 3, and 3, 1, okay? Uh, you just uh, do permutations. And times the coefficient, and the coefficient is non-trivial. And the coefficient, it turns out, is a product of Barnes G functions. 2 alpha 1 
I think plus one, g of two alpha two. Maybe I get it slightly wrong. Maybe it was in fact minus one. And g of alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha three minus one, g of alpha one minus alpha two plus alpha three, well, let's say, plus alpha three minus one, uh, times g, so again in the denominator, g of uh, alpha one minus alpha two plus alpha three minus one, and g of alpha one uh, plus alpha two minus alpha three minus one. I think this is it. Uh, this minus one, I think, is a very unfortunate notation of the Barnes function, and it would be much more convenient if Barnes would have defined the function shifted by one. All formulas will be a little bit simpler, I think. So, uh, so the claim is that. Uh, so first, the claim is that. When you do the asymptotic expansion of this, first, this coincides with the uh, topological recursion tau function, would be tau function that I defined before. Uh, so basically, this tau should be equal to exponential sum of h bar to the 2g minus 2 fg of some spectral curve. And what is the spectral curve? The spectral curve is the one you would get by just solving the equation determinant of y minus phi of x equals zero. And you see that because, so, so basically which is equivalent to saying that y square equals one half of trace of phi of x to a square. And you see that is, uh, this is something which has a double pole, i equals one to three, of alpha i square over x minus z i to a square. And there is also some coefficient in front of, uh, with simple poles. And the beta i's are some functions of the alpha i's. I'm not writing them, but basically this is the spectral curve. And the claim is that if you take that spectral curve, uh, it has genus zero, uh, compute the topological recursion invariance fg, then you correctly get the asymptotic expansion of uh, the dorn otto zamolchikov zamolchikov function. Uh, so this is the claim, and uh, just to have an idea of what, uh, what is the topology of that curve, one way to, to see uh, that curve is, okay, you had the three-point function of an SL2 theory, so since it's SL2, you just do a doubling of this graph, Okay, and now you thicken the graph into a surface. So it looks like something like that. It's a genus zero surface. In fact, all what I'm saying here for the uh, three-point function of SL2C uh, would work for SLN and for n-point function. Uh, typically, if you would have a four-point function with SL2, you would draw a graph with four points, you would double it, and when you thicken it, you see that what you get would be a genus one curve. When you thicken it, you would get something like, uh, sorry. I need to do that to, to my conclusion. And if you would do a SL3, for instance, or SL, yes, SL3, you would do this, and it would again be a genus one curve, for example. Okay? And so I'm just going to say a few words about resurgence. Uh, for that, we need one more. So I'm going to conclude very shortly about resurgence. So where are the poles? Oops. Where are the poles of Borel transform? Sorry. What are the poles of Borel transform? And basically, the poles of Borel transform are going to be periods of those curves. Uh, so. 
In fact, the, uh, the um, Borel transform of the Bard's function is explicitly known. Log of g of x plus 1 uh, is integral over e to the, well, let's, bar, let's call it h bar minus 1 x is e to the h bar x minus 1 x s ds, 0 to infinity, 1 over s d over ds of uh, 1 over e to the s minus 1, minus 1 over s, minus 1 over 12, I think, minus s over 12, sorry. I think this is correct. The last two terms are just there to kill the pole at, the, at s equals 0. And you see that all the poles are at s equals uh, 2 pi i n, well, without 0. So it's a little bit like uh, André was presenting. So all the poles on the imaginary axis, but except 0. Uh, so when you apply this, you see that the poles of the Borel transform, so the, Bo the Borel transform for the DOZZ formula has only poles. Uh, the Borel transform has only poles. And you see that the arguments of the bound function contain 2 alpha 1, 2 alpha 2, or alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3, and so on. And in that curve, they are exactly the integrals over some cycles, so typically, for instance, take this cycle. Uh, so here, uh, the, let me write the period. So for each gamma, let me write 1 over 2 pi i into over gamma of y dx. Uh, so here we get alpha 1 and minus alpha 1, if you take that one, or that one. And here, if you take that one, you would get 2 alpha 1. So this is one of the singularities, one of the poles we have here. Uh, on alpha 1 plus alpha 2, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 minus alpha 3 also corresponds to a certain cycle. And basically, they all correspond to some cycles. You can now play the same game with the four-point function or with an SL3 or theory or anything. Uh, again, you would have some, typically, some singularities of the Borel transform corresponding to such cycles. Uh, but you have also those non-trivial cycles. Uh, those non-contractible cycles will also play a role in the Borel transform. Uh, there is a big difference here uh, between this kind of cycles that you have in the three-point function, where you see the Borel transform is very trivial and the uh, resurgence properties are very trivial. And in SL4, uh, sorry, in, in the four-point function, uh, you have something much more non-trivial that happens. But my time is over. And so what I just, so it was just to give you a small glimpse of why topological recursion is useful. It is useful for many problems in enumerative algebraic geometry or random matrices or conformal field theory or integrable systems. It's very useful. It appears everywhere. And also, uh, it has very deep questions related to resurgent questions. And uh, just first to make sense of those series. And uh, also, uh, but because topological recursion is very closely related to geometry, it can give an, a geometric understanding of those Borel transforms. And in fact, what I'm working on at the moment is really a method to extract just from the spectral curve all the information about the Borel transform, so all the singularities and basically uh, all the properties of the Borel transform. This is underway, this is not finished, and I hope to finish soon, but at least in this kind of formula, DOZZ and so on, it gives exactly what we want. Thank you for your attention. I uh, have for Barnes function, I have a uh, uh, resurgence property for logarithm. It's only to uh, go to Barnes function by formally making exponent by convolutions, yeah. yeah. Which is kind of uh, uh, too raw because it already for gamma function, you get a uh, logarithm of gamma function and gamma function itself. And it's not just freely, uh, yeah. generally think it's yeah. kind of much smaller. Yeah, yeah. But in fact, so I didn't have time on, it would require much more than one hour to explain. 
uh, but in, top in the topological recursion framework, there is a natural way of uh, saying which coefficient you put in front of each cycle exactly on, on when you take the log or when you, when you don't take the log. Uh, it's, uh, it's there in the, in the framework. So indeed, sometimes it's easier to take the log and sometimes it's easier not to take the log. For instance, with the array function, it's easier not to take the log. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, in the gamma function, if I remember correctly, if you, when you take the log, you have a, a, a sequence of poles. Mm -hmm. And if you take the gamma itself, then it, it becomes one branch cut. Yeah. Is it something like that? Yes. Okay. Yes, something like that appears here. <laughs> And also for the bounds function, basically there is just uh, one uh, one cut. Does the psi function always satisfy a differential equation, at least formally, always uh, satisfy a differential equation with okay. synchronization of the curve? It's it always satisfies an equation. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, for, first of all, of first of all, topological recursion itself. So since it's a recursion among the coefficients, can be rephrased in a linear equation satisfied by the tau function or by the, wave, by the psi function. So I, but it's more like uh, an ODE in an infinite number of parameters, if you if you'd like. Uh, so it can be rephrased in that way, but still it's enough to get the recursion, uh, the coefficient by, by recursion. And uh, in some cases, indeed, it reduces to a nice uh, ODE, which is called the quantum curve. Uh, this is, mm, well, OK. Uh, the answer is yes or no. It depends what we are talking about. Maybe I should say that this is no when the uh, uh, curve is higher genus. It's definitely no. And I think people doing structural recursion should stop telling people that in higher genus yeah. this is true because it's not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so this is uh, basically it really depends uh, on some. Okay. There, there are extra data that you can put to make sure that the answer would be yes. But in many examples, in fact, the answer is no. There is no differential equation. In the case of nodes, what is expected is a difference equation. But this is not proved. It is another conjecture. Uh, OK, well, with Marcos, we gave a formula. Uh, which still has some free parameters, uh, the characteristic of the theta function, basically. Uh, so the, the, these trans-series terms look like a, the expansion of a theta function on theta derivatives. I, I can show it to you. And in matrix models, they are really natural, and that's why we introduced them, because in matrix models, we, we, we saw them. So we kind of conjecture that they should be there all the times, and they are precisely what is needed to make uh, the tau function, uh, first to make it really a tau function, and to have good modular properties. Uh, OK, I, I can give you the definition if you want. <laughs> it's not so complicated. There may should be mentioned that these corrections are well defined for the A polynomial, but in general, yeah. it's, it's not so easy to define. I mean, they yeah. are only valid for good hook curves, right? I mean, special points in the moduli space. At a generic point in the moduli space, these corrections are not really a trans series. Uh, are, I mean, are not really so clearly well defined. Okay, maybe we can discuss that at a later time, but uh, I've made some progress where I think I know better how to, to define them in yeah, general. We also know how mm -hmm. to define it better, but this is a generic question of space, but it's a different. Uh, I think the way we define it is really working for this particular curve. Yeah. But in general, it's, it has to be curved. Yeah. Well, let's thank the speaker.